Hello, this is Mike Sadlowski again for CPS Science Show number four. And this time we've done the Halloween, we've done dry ice, we've done egg in the bottle. This time we're going to do some microwave science tricks. Now, I should tell you before you do this, I am doing these for you so that you do not have to do them at home. However, if you choose to try any of these at home, make sure your parents know and make sure your parents are helping. Uh, the last thing you want to do is ruin a microwave. Um, because that'd be pretty expensive. And so don't do that. So if you if you wanna be calm and safe, just watch me and, and have fun. If you wanna try them again at home, make sure your parents are on board. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is I have a bar of ivory soap. It has to be ivory soap. Now, if you use another soap, nothing bad's gonna happen. But this soap used to have a commercial that said, said something like the soap that floats. This is the only bar of soap that would yeah, throw in a tub or throw in a bucket of water and it actually would float. It's not too mysterious why. The reason why is when they make this soap, they blend it and whip it together with a bunch of air. There's just a lot of, there's millions of, you know, tiny microscopic air bubbles in here. It's a lighter soap. And now it's, it, it's a lighter soap. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to take the soap. We could use the whole bar. I just don't want to waste the whole bar. And again, just, it's pretty soft, but I'm just gonna cut the bar and get about a quarter of it, a fourth. And then I'm gonna unwrap the soap and I'm gonna put it on a plate. All right, all unwrapped. And what we're gonna do is put this in the microwave. Before I've done it, kind of did this out of order. I actually blocked the light of the microwave. No big deal, I'm gonna take this cardboard out so we have light again and we're going to put this in the microwave doesn't really matter if you have a, a turntable or not for this one and let's go ahead and uh, my daughter Lexi is taping this so can we see in there pretty well it's going to the light will mm -hmm. light up I'm going to go ahead and put this on for a couple minutes and let's just see what happens if you, I know the, the view inside that mic mesh microwave door is not that, oh, look at that, is not that great, but we'll take it out in a second. You can clearly see our soap that floats is going crazy. All right, I, I'm going to stop it as soon as I see it stop expanding, just, be, just because it's over. All right, looks like I actually only went for 30 seconds. We're gonna take our soap out. And here, it's a little warm, but not horrible. Your, by the way, your whole house is gonna smell like ivory soap, or your whole kitchen at least, is gonna smell like ivory soap. But here is what your one quarter of a bar of ivory soap, actually not even, that was still a little unreacted there, did. Can you use it? Sure. Just take a little bit off. Get it under the water, rub your hands so you're not wasting it. Here's what happens. Remember I said there were thousands of, of tiny microscopic air pockets in there? Uh, when you microwave the soap, it gets even softer and then the air pockets vibrate really fast and then expand. And that expand makes it the soap turn into a frothy, kind of like a marshmallow type consistency. That one, pretty safe to do, no, no real harm there. And it makes, uh, makes things smell clean. Okay, now for the next one, I'm gonna do something very similar with the marshmallow. Okay, so a marshmallow, what are the comparisons to an ivory soap? Well, a bar of ivory soap. Well, think of all the, the thousands of tiny air pockets that's in a marshmallow. Marshmallow squishy. And this one's actually almost a little stale, but it's still squishy. So we're gonna put that in the microwave. Let's put it on for about 30 seconds. See what happens. I'm not sure you can see the door, but it's already getting, oh, it's probably three, four, five times the size it used to be and it's still going. And we're still at 13 seconds here. And I see it stopping, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop. It's starting to go down a little bit, but there is your marshmallow. Pretty warm, it's actually shrinking now. Uh, it still will always be at least double, but it's shrinking because now the air pocket is cooling. All those air pockets are cooling, the vibrations are, are calming down, and it is able to uh, to get smaller. It's already cooling off, but it is a uh, pretty pretty wishy mess there. Okay, last one. For this one, now this is the one I really mean. 
Uh, do not do this one unless your parents are okay with you doing this in the microwave. Uh, you can find this online, but I am doing this as a person that knows science, and I'm I'll be just to be safe. I'm advising you not to do it. But if you do it, make sure your parents are with you. No. All right. What I have here is I have a light bulb. This is not an LED bulb. It's not one of those fluorescent bulbs. Uh, definitely make sure it is a regular average light bulb. It actually doesn't even matter if the light bulb is, um, de is dead or not. It doesn't matter. It'll still work. So what we're going to do now, if I put this in the microwave, anybody ever accidentally put a fork in the microwave? It sparks and it will char your microwave and damage it. Same thing will happen here. So we're going to just shield that a little bit. And to shield it, I just have a jar of plain tap water. And I'm going to put the light bulb in the tap water just so that the, the microwave waves, the radiation, is not hitting the metal directly. I'm going to put this in the microwave, but now I want you to see what's happening. So I just have a piece of cardboard, and I'm going to block the light in my microwave. Okay, now we're going to close it. I'm going to turn off the lights in here so you can see it a little bit better. I know we got a glare from the window a little bit. All right, let's see what happens. It lights up. You now have a light bulb that is not attached to any electricity that is lighting up. And we're going to do it pretty quickly. Don't let it go more than about 10 seconds because then it just gets pretty hot. Nothing happened. It's barely warm. And there you have it. You got your three microwave science tricks. So that's it for the demos for CPS Science Show number four. Hope you enjoy the rest of the show and you have a great Thanksgiving. Hello, my name's Eric Sandville. I work here at the University of Missouri in the Department of Geological Sciences and I study earthquakes. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about how earthquakes work. And there are two parts to my video presentation today. And uh, in the first part, I wanna explain in general how earthquakes work and we'll do an experiment and show you how something called the earthquake cycle works using an, a, an experiment that models uh, a kind of fault that's locked and could produce a big earthquake. And then the second part, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how this works and how this applies to earthquakes here in Missouri. So in order to understand earthquakes, the first thing we have to think a little bit about is where earthquakes occur. And I have a map to show you, it shows you where earthquakes occur on the surface of the earth. So the first thing you can see, I think, is that all of these red dots spread across our map here of the entire earth. Each one of those dots represents the location of an earthquake. Um, and they're color coded by how deep they occur. But the important thing to see in this map is that earthquakes are not evenly distributed across the surface of the earth. They occur in distinct belts, in zones. And you can see there's this zone here in the Western Pacific that's called the Ring of Fire, because there's lots of volcanoes, but as you can see, there's lots of earthquakes as well. The, all of this band of earthquakes that I'm outlining with my cursor all correspond to the edge of something called a tectonic plate. This particular tectonic plate is called the Pacific Plate one of the fastest moving plates on our planet. It moves about 10 centimeters every year to about the Northwest. We live on another plate. We live on the North American continent, which makes up part of the North American plate. We live right here in central Missouri. You can see there are a few earthquakes there, okay? But most of the earthquakes that occur on the planet occur at the edges of these plates. You can see we have a whole bunch of earthquakes out in California, down into the Gulf of Mexico. All of these earthquakes occur at the edge or at the meeting point of the Pacific plate and the North American plates. And these two plates are sliding past one another here. And that's what we want to talk about today about how that works. Because we don't get a big earthquake every day, even though these plates are always moving. And in fact, in this slide, we can see that uh, we can see a model 
of how these plates move. And you can see, if we go over to this part of the map, this is the Pacific plate. So the red lines show the boundaries of the plates. That's where all those earthquakes occur. I'm not showing earthquakes in this map. Instead, I'm showing these arrows, which represent the motion of the plate. And by the way, the longer the arrow, the faster the plate moves. So you can see the long arrows here in the Pacific plate showing how fast that Pacific plate is moving 10 centimeters every year. The North American plate that we live on here is going much more slowly, only about a centimeter and a half every year. Down here though, it's a little hard to see, these plates are sliding past one another. So what does this have to do with how earthquakes work? Well, first of all, that's why we have earthquakes. Earth earthquakes are produced as a result of the relative motion of plates moving with respect to one another, okay? But we don't have a really big earthquake every day. In fact, often it can be a really long time between big earthquakes. For instance, in California, uh, if we think about uh, Northern California and the large city of San Francisco, San Francisco experiences a big earthquake about every 100 years. On average, it doesn't mean exactly 100 years, but on average about every 100 years. But that's not because the Pacific Plate and North American Plate starts and stops moving. Those plates are huge, massive pieces of rock that move across the surface of the earth. And so they're always moving. It would take an enormous amount of energy to even slow them down a little bit. So they're always moving. So why is it that we don't have big earthquakes every day? We don't even necessarily have small earthquakes every day, although they're pretty common. So how does this work? Well, to understand how this works, we have to talk about a very complicated kind of quantity and that's called strain. And strain is basically a way to describe how we change the shape of a rock or an, an object like a rubber band or even like a stick, okay? And if we apply a force or a stress to a rock or the rubber band or a stick, we can change its shape. For instance, if we look at the rubber band here, if we take our rubber band and we pull it out, we apply a force to it, so we, we lengthen it, we extend it, all right? We change its shape, we make it longer, okay? If we remove the force, however, the rubber band's gonna go back to its original shape. And you can do this yourself with your own rubber band. You can take a rubber band in your hand, you can stretch it out, and then when you take stop applying the force, stop stretching the rubber band, it'll go back to its original shape. This is a kind of strain or kind of change in shape that's a temporary change in shape. Another word for this is we call it elastic. Elastic means it's a temporary strain or a temporary change in shape. And believe it or not, the Earth's crust or these tectonic plates work in a similar fashion. When we apply a force to them, they can also bend and if we remove the force, they would go back to its approximately to its original shape as well. In fact, a good analogy I like to use in this case, is I like to use a stick. Believe it or not, sticks can tell us something about earthquakes. And see here I have a stick and I'm holding it at two ends. As you can see here with my one hand and my other hand here. And right now I'm not applying any force. And so it's pretty straight. But if I apply a force at both ends, I can bend my stick. I can change its shape. But if I remove the force, it goes back to its original shape. That's what's called elastic strain. So I've changed the shape just temporarily. But what do you think is gonna happen if I keep applying a force and making it stronger and stronger? And so it bends more and more until what's gonna happen? It snaps, it breaks. And in fact, the Earth's crust works in a very similar way. If we go back to our slide, we can see that the Earth's crust will bend and bend until finally the amount of bending exceeds the strength of the crust, just like we exceeded the strength of the stick and it snaps and it breaks. That's actually a lot like what happens in an earthquake, okay? And this process of slowly bending the Earth's crust until it breaks actually is called something, or is something called the earthquake cycle. And so the way it works is we have a graph here and we can imagine that the stress 
as we apply more and more force or stress, stress is just force per area, as we build up more and more force until we get to the point where the Earth's crust can't, can't stand anymore, it breaks suddenly. So this process of stress buildup is a, a process that can take hundreds of years, but this process of breaking happens very quickly, kind of like our stick, where we, it took a lot longer to bend it than the breaking happened in a fraction of a second, okay? And so here we have a kind of model that people who study earthquakes like to think about earthquakes, where we have a block that's stuck to, the, uh, to, the, to a table, and we have a, a spring that we're pulling along. And when we pull hard enough, then we're gonna unstick the block and it moves. And so this is what's known as stick slip behavior. So the stick part is where we allow it to build up the stress and the slip part happens when we it essentially breaks and it moves. And that's really a lot like how earthquakes work in the most simple model that we have for them. So I have an experiment or a model of this that we can look at here. So if we look at on the table, I've set up a model or an experiment of this process. And it's a model very similar to the kind of fault that we have in California. It's called a strike slip fault. And it's a fault that moves only horizontally, slides horizontally past one another. Just like this would be the Pacific plate and this would be the North American plate. But the way this really works is, is these two plates aren't always sliding past one another. They get stuck together. And here they're stuck together by two toothpicks, okay? And I have a mechanism you can see over here that I can, by cranking this, by turning this around and around, I can cause the two plates to slide past one another. And so what's gonna happen is, is we're gonna see these two toothpicks, just like the Earth's crust, bend more and more until you can guess what's gonna happen. So what I'm gonna start to do now is I'm gonna start to move the two plates past one another, but remember they can't move because they're stuck together by the toothpicks. So instead, what we wanna look at, we want, wanna look really closely at the two toothpicks, okay? So as I turn, two plates are moving and you can see the two plates are stuck together here because this, this piece of tape across our boundary here, which is known as a fault, which is a break in the earth. Those two are basically, you can see right parallel to one another going across that fault. And I want you to watch closely also to the toothpicks. Watch as the plates move more and more, try to move, even though they're stuck together, look how much more of the Earth's crust or the toothpicks bend. Look how much bending, more and more strain until, oh, they broke. And there was the earthquake. It was enough force to actually dislodge our pretty heavy steel ball here. So it was a sizable earthquake. And you can see what happened after the earthquake is that those two sides of the faults now are not next to one another. They moved. In fact, we can take a ruler out here and we can measure the amount of what's called slip. The amount of slip is how much that fault moved in an earthquake, okay? And it moved about two centimeters in this case. For a really big earthquake, you can actually move 200 meters. So that's a lot more than our, our model here, but this gives you an idea of how earthquakes work. So in the second part of the video, I'll come back and I'll talk about how this applies to uh, Missouri. Hi, my name is Liz Kalanda. I'm a student at the University of Missouri, and today's topic is birthday history and science. Specifically, where did the fun birthday traditions originate and how do trick candles work? To start, let's go to Egypt, Greece, and Germany. Ancient Egyptians started the tradition of having annual birthday celebrations with birthday cakes. The only ones with special access to the rare ingredients were the powerful Egyptians, such as the pharaohs. Ancient Greeks made birthday cakes that were circular like the moon to honor Artemis, the goddess of the moon. Candles were lit on cakes to resemble the way the moon shines in the night sky. 18th century Germany started the German tradition called Kinderfest. This is where the idea of using candles to represent each year of life originated. Speaking of candles, let's learn a fun party trick, the homemade trick candle. So you're gonna need a candle and a lighter or a match 
and you're gonna blow out the candle and then light a match and hold it about an inch or two above the wick where there's a trail of smoke or really vaporized wax is what it really is. So what is happening? A hot ember remains on the wick after you blow the candle out. Heat from this ember vaporizes the wax and sends it up into the air as a vaporized wax column. By introducing a new flame to this column, the vaporized wax particles reignite and travel back down to the wick, relighting the candle. But what's the trick behind store-bought trick candles? Magnesium. Magnesium is a highly reactive metal. It's added to the inside of these candle wicks and it needs oxygen to burn. So before you blow the candle out, the flame is what is keeping oxygen from coming in contact with magnesium, kind of acts as a barrier. But after you blow the candle out, oxygen does come in contact with magnesium and magnesium dust particles ignite, causing little sparks. The sparks then ignite the vaporized wax column and the candle relights. Lastly, remember to live every day like it's your birthday. Hi everyone, my name is Allie Pig and I'm a student at Mizzou. So you've probably all gotten to blow out candles on your birthday. And I'm sure that instead of wondering what presents you got or what flavor your cake is, you are asking yourself, now what is the science behind that flame going out? No, maybe not. Well, today I'm going to tell you why those birthday candles go out when we blow at them. Some people think it's the carbon dioxide from your lungs that you blow out, that that suffocates the flame and it causes it to go out. Well, that's actually not true. The air you puff out is actually more oxygen than carbon dioxide, so that can't be right. Some people think the air you blow out cools down the flame to where it goes out, but that can't be right either, because the air you blow out is actually warmer than the air outside your mouth. And some people think that if you spit a little bit more when you blow, the moisture will put out the flame. Well, that's just gross, and no one can actually blow and spit enough to make the candle go out. What's actually happening here is that when you blow, the force from your blown air is pushing the flame away from its fuel source. The flame disconnects from the fuel, and so it goes out. So, now you know why the birthday candle goes out when you blow at it. If only it were that easy to get what you wish for when you do blow your candles out. <laughs>